birthday, Father's House, Orange County. Happy birthday for those in this room, in the video experience you're watching online. What a journey it has been. I'm honored to celebrate another year that God has granted us. Y'all could be seated. For those watching online, we're nosy folk. We want to know where you are tuning in from, but family, we made it. We made it, yes. Oh, in the last five years, we have been in five different venues. We have been robbed three times. We've gone through one global pandemic. Y'all, this is funny. Y'all, y'all, real serious right now. This is some funny stuff. In addition to surviving a global pandemic, we survived a building renovation project. And guess what? We're still here. We're still praising Jesus. We're still serving him. Amen. My hope and my goal and how we started the church is that for those walking into this space, that it would literally feel like home. I'm so proud of ha at how homey we have made this place feel. In fact, the homeless in Orange County, they really do love us. In fact, in our first venue, I remember preaching one time and I went to uh, backstage, there's this little small room that uh, pastors, we were able to go in and study and prep. And I opened up the pastor's room and there was a man without a home that was sleeping on our couch. And I just boop, 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 stepped right out, closed the door and said, sweet dreams, man, I don't know, sleeping on the couch. Mm -hmm. Also, there was another, another lovely man that clearly was in deep need. And so he permanently borrowed um, some purses from our volunteers at the volunteer room and also the iPads from the kids area. Yeah. And then even now, there's this beautiful lady without a home that comes in virtually every Sunday and takes all of the feminine supplies, the perfume, the hairspray from our women's bathroom. So if you have not felt like home, we clearly are, are a home for other people. And I hope that you have felt welcomed. But in our journey of planning a church, we have been mobile and uh, we had these two trucks that, that to touted and towed everything that our church had. And they were broken into twice. They were actually the cabs of the truck were used to uh, do drugs and have adult activities. Yep. Yep. We also lost a Sunday. You guys, this is way funnier, okay? You guys are real serious. No, it, it, it's, it's absolutely hilarious because one Sunday, we lost our venue to the International Belly Dancing Competition. Of course, we lost our venue to COVID. Yep. Also, let's not forget about the Sunday I affectionately call Stripper Sunday because we showed up when the venue before us was rolling out and cleaning up, and they were like a bootleg version of the Thunder from Down Under. And I had to preach on a stage that had body oil on the floor. It wasn't anointing oil, honey. Like, the only thing to clean that was the blood of the lamb, and I didn't have that, so Clorox had to do. One thing about this journey that is absolutely true is that it hasn't been easy but it has been so worth it. It's been so worth it. Uh, our word for the year is resilient faith. And as I think about our church entering into our fifth year as a church, I can't help but think about the number five. Church, the number five has significance because all throughout the Bible, it's noted where important things were in the number five. And I'm a word nerd, so bear with me as I go down a little bit of a rabbit trail as we dive into today's time as we open up God's word. But five matters. Number five matters. Does anyone know how many stones David picked up before he slayed Goliath? Good answer, Bible scholars. Yes. Does anyone know how many books there are in the law of the Bible? Oh, good answer. Do you know how many times Jesus was pierced on the cross? Yes. Anointing oil, in the, anointing oil in the Bible is comprised out of five ingredients. In fact, the altar in the tabernacle was five cubits long and five cubits wide. Abraham made five sacrifices in Genesis 15. So clearly, the number five means something. Does anyone know what the number five represents? Woo! It represents God's grace, God's mercy, God's goodness, God's favor. Ooh! Five matters! I'm so excited because in the last five years, God's grace has sustained us and will sustain us. God's goodness has been with us and will continue to be with us. God's mercy has been a cloak on us and will continue to cloak us. And God's favor, my goodness, God's favor has been with us. 
Can we thank God and give him a clap of praise? Like my, my mentor told me, the grit that don't quit is grace you can't waste. What is grace? Grace is God's divine ability to overcome trial, trauma, and tribulation. Do me a favor, church. Look at your hand. Look at your palm. You have five fingers. Five fingers. And with this hand and these five fingers, they put to labor and use the work that God has called you to. And with these five fingers in the palm of your hand, they're used to worship the Lord. And with these five hands today, I pray that we raise them and declare, God, you are worthy of our praise because this is our fifth year, the year of God's mercy, God's goodness, God's grace, God's favor. We're continuing on in worshiping our Lord. So Heavenly Father, we, we celebrate you. You are worth it all. The last five years, we have seen your goodness. We have seen your grace. We have seen your mercy. And now we ask, God, you continue to pour out your favor as we worship you. In the mighty, matchless name of Jesus, the church says, amen.
we give God one big clap of praise for year five, the year of God's grace, the year of God's goodness, the year of His mercy, amen? Oh, okay, you guys came with your church faces. No, 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 no. I need the spirit of espresso to fall in this place, all right? Because today you have permission. We're going to turn up because it's a party, church. Can I get one big amen? Yes. Y'all can go ahead and be seated. Woo, this is five. This is five. This is five. A year of God's grace. If you're a note taker, I, I want to make sure that we all walk away with holding on to a little bit of theology, a little bit of Bible study, and God's grace. I don't see notebooks out, so I'm kind of questioning, like, what you all come to church for, all right? <laughs> notebooks, iPhones, whatever it is, but I want you to write this down. What is grace? We love to sing about God's grace. We love to talk about God's grace. But I don't want us to sing about God's grace if we don't know what grace is, amen? Grace is God's divine power to overcome. God's divine power to overcome trial, trauma, tribulation. Let me tell you something. There have been some things that we have overcome in this journey. But like my mentor said, the grit that don't quit is the grace you can't waste. King Solomon put it this way in Proverbs 24, 16. It's on the screen. King Solomon, wisest man, one of the wisest men in the known world said, for though the righteous fall seven times, they what? Ooh, say it with your chest. They what? Rise they rise again. I love this verse, not because I've studied it, but because I've lived it, fam. I've lived it. Now, I haven't, I've never told this story here in church. Um, it's embarrassing, but we can laugh about it now. Because if I can laugh about it, then you can laugh about it. And if you're not laughing at church, I think you're doing church wrong, okay? But this verse is something I've lived through because my junior year of high school, I was nominated as captain of the varsity track team which is an oddity because mostly that role is reserved for seniors. So it's very, very honored and privileged. And so when Coach John and Coach Julia asked me to run hurdles, I said, absolutely. Why? Because my mother, Mama Millie said, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I'm not sure that's what Paul was referring to, mother, but whatever, I believed it. And I was like, okay, now what would possess a 5'2 Mexican to jump over Objects, I don't know, but I literally had the faith that I could do it. And this is the beginning of the track season, and we hosted an invitational. An invitational is when you invited all the schools in your district to compete, to basically size each other up, size up the competition. Well, I was in one of the first heats, one of the first races of the day. And in this first heat, I was sandwiched in between two sisters. To the left of me was Franisha. To the right of me was Aisha. They were about seven foot six and definitely related to Goliath, all right? Their legs came up to about my collarbone. And I'm right in the middle of them. I was just like, you know what? I, I'm gonna give them a run for their money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready. I am mentally prepared. I have trained, I have listened to my coaches, and I am waiting in eager expectation in the starting blocks. My legs are coiled tightly, my hands are taut, positioned so when the gun shoots, I'm out of those blocks like a jackrabbit. Boom, over hurdle one, clear it. Boom, over hurdle two, clear it. I'm about to approach the third hurdle. And out of the corner of my eye, I see one of the sisters creeping up. And I did the fatal flaw that Coach Julia said never to do. She said, never look to the left or the right. You got to stay focused and keep your eyes on your race. Yeah. Now, that's a word for somebody in here, but that's another sermon for another day. I made the mistake. I looked to my left, and I saw one of the sisters creeping up. And what happened is that my cadence, my pace, my momentum was thrown off. So the top of my knee nicked the third hurdle. That threw off my cadence, my momentum, and my speed. So when I approached the fourth hurdle, guess what happened? My knee actually hit the hurdle, causing me to wobble and stumble, losing the inertia that I need. So by the time I got to the fifth hurdle, I fell completely, boom, over the fifth hurdle. Not to be outdone. The two sisters passed me, but I'm thinking I could still get third place. I pop back up, run to the sixth hurdle, boom, fall over it. Seventh hurdle, boom fall over it. Eighth hurdle. I have no momentum. I don't know what was possessed me to even try. Boom, fall over it. Ninth hurdle. I had every ounce in me determined to get over the ninth hurdle because the auditorium is completely silent. There's one lone clapper in the top area that's like, you know the pathetic pity clap? The one you never want? Yeah. I fall over the ninth hurdle. 
I'm limping to the 10th hurdle. My knees are bloody. My shins are bruised. I have no energy inside of me, including no pride. I pick up my left leg, straddle the hurdle. I'm sobbing. I pick up my right leg, pick it up over the hurdle and limp to the finish line. I was so mortified, so exhausted, I just fell to the floor. Do you know what no 17 year old wants when they've fallen over so many hurdles and they're mortified? An ambulance to come and draw attention to them. But an ambulance came onto the track, they put me on a gurney and took me over to the first aid station. I'm in the first aid station and I'm mortified. I'm crying, at the corner of my eye, I see Coach Julia shagging her way over to me with a huge smile. She looked at me very lovingly and said, Bianca, I am so proud of you. I looked at her befuddled and confused. <laughs> proud of me? Did you see through tears? Did you see the race? I came in dead last. The heat behind me passed me. Everyone was laughing at me. She said, no, no matter what, you didn't quit. You ran your race. So when King Solomon says in Proverbs 24, 16, though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. I want us to know that this word fall in Hebrew isn't a moral failure. Nope, nope, it's not moral failure. It is a trial. It is tribulation. And even though we go through these troubles, Solomon tells us that when we fall, we are not to lose trust in the Lord. Now, the righteous people, well, well done, Tina, they will say, yeah, absolutely. But the skeptical people, like me, I'm just like, we're not supposed to lose trust. If I stop that sentence there, you can come with skepticism. But what I want to bring clarity today in our fifth birthday, the year of God's grace, is that we don't have to lose trust in God because we're strong. We don't have to lose trust in God because he has given us his grace. And what is grace? Grace is divine power to overcome. That's a right place for an amen. I'm going to teach Orange County how to help a preacher preach today, okay? Grace is God's divine power to overcome. Now, notice that King Solomon, uh, put the scripture back on the screen. King Solomon, he notes a specific, a specific, specific, a, it's my birthday, I get to say whatever I want, a specific people group. He says that the righteous fall, the righteous fall, but it's a different scenario for the ratchet. When the ratchet fall into calamity and suffering, they can't hang. Back that up with scripture. I'm glad you said, I'm glad you want to know this because Solomon also says in Proverbs 14, 32, he says that the wicked are overthrown by calamity. These are the people that are like, I've fallen and I can't get up. I'm on the floor of life and I'm just going to quit. That's it. I quit. I'm done. No, they stay down. How many times, Bible scholars, answers on the screen, how many times does it say that the righteous fall? Seven. Seven merely means in biblical numerology, it's the number of perfection or completion. So what Solomon is winking to is that even in moments of complete perfection, complete completion, there will be trials, there will be trauma, there will be tribulation. But the righteous, somebody say the righteous. righteous. The righteous, get back up. Church, we have had some hurdles that we've had to overcome. And there's been some hurdles that we've fallen over, but we rise again. Today is going to look different because we're not in a, in a series. Uh, we're not even going ex exegetically through a book of the Bible. We're going to be going through the book of Haggai in a couple of weeks. I'm very excited about that. But today, if you've come to church today, it's a celebration of God's faithfulness. If you're new to church, you came on a great Sunday because you get to be a witness and a testament to see that God's faithfulness has not only allowed us to survive, but he's given us the ability to thrive in the face of opposition. So most organizations, most churches, when they celebrate another year of existence, they call it an anniversary. An anniversary. An anniversary is a date in which took place the year before that people make note of. That's an anniversary. But since day one of our church existence, I was so vehemently against anniversary. I didn't want an anniversary. It just felt old and boring. No, I love birthday parties, okay? Those are the epic celebrations. In fact, we love birthday parties so much. We were six months old, and I said, we are celebrating our half birthday. We had balloons. We had cake. We had a party, okay? Because what is a birthday? A birthday is a celebration of birth. And this meant a lot to me because I have been here since the ground floor, 
I have been here when this church was nothing more than a hope and a dream and a prayer. It was a seed in the womb of so many people. And any woman in this space with style and grace who has been pregnant, you know when you're pregnant, it's cute at first, and then it gets hard, and you start stretching. Then your feet get swollen, and you begin to curse the pain that you're in. And when you're pushing something out, you begin to sweat. When you're pushing something out, you're in pain. And five years ago, we pushed a big-headed baby out into the world, and that's why this is a birthday. That's why this is a birthday, because we have been pushing this baby out. A couple weeks ago, Darius, a worship leader here, gave this acronym during worship, and he said, push, pray until something happens. That's what we've been doing. And we're not done pushing because we are birthing something into this world that since inception, the enemy has wanted to take out. And this birthing began with a group of people who believe that we can birth something more than just a hospital for the broken, but a home for the lost. Birthing something that was more than just a restoration place for the weary, but a group of people that believe that God could redeem people's broken stories for his glory and for our good. This year we started with a phrase. This is like our intention for the year, and it came out of a passage out of Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 1 through 2, it says this, it's on the screen. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance, assurance, confidence and assurance about what we do not see. I have seen what this church is going to be, and I have confidence and assurance that though it doesn't look like it yet, we will see the goodness of, the God, of God in the land of the living. Though it doesn't feel like it yet because it's about 92 and a half degrees in this room because our AC broke, glory to God for those that tithe and give here at TFHOC because we're going to get a new AC. Bless the Lord, okay? That's a birthday celebration right there, honey. You try preaching with lights on you in 92 degrees, baby. If you think it's hot in here, hell is hotter. Repent, family, okay? <laughs> Verse 2, this is what the ancients were commended for. I have been in ministry, it just hit me, I've been in ministry for 20 years. And that's really hard because I'm only 23. So I just don't understand how the math works, but I was homeschooled, so. But in the last 20 years, I've had a front row seat to see God do transforming works and the word that God gave us this year was resilient faith, resilient faith. We prayed and sensed that God would give us a faith that would rebound. We believe that, that God would give us a faith to remind people to get back up when life no knocks them down. We've survived so much in the last five years, but God's great grace has covered us in beautiful ways. What is God's grace? God's divine ability to overcome. You know what? That doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in community. That's why we love community groups. Community groups are starting in a couple weeks. For the, our online family, we have online community groups, in-person community groups, community groups that are faith, community groups that are fun, whatever, whatever your stroke is, we got some folks for you. And why is that? Because Ecclesiastes 4 says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If one of them falls down, the other one can help the other up. Now, this is a good Bible verse, but it's even better living. In the last couple years here at TFH, I have seen people in this community be family to people in need. The last couple years, whether it's Eric Tran losing his father or Shavilla Martin losing her husband or other people who have lost loved ones, I have seen the church community come and rally around people who've lost their loved ones and shown up like family for them in times of loss. I've seen people in this community who have fallen on rough economic times or maybe even lost their job. And we're not a community of people that are like, hey, get a loan, sign up for PPP, I'll pray for you. No, we're a community that have reached into our pockets and generously given to people benevolently who are in need. I have, I've witnessed over the last couple years, I, with my own eyes, have seen people who have come in physically sick, emotionally sick, psychologically sick, and have been prayed over by people like Mama Mary in Favors, Coco Cottrell, or even Abel Sunny. And these people have found true healing in the mighty hand and name of Jesus. 
When I tell you that this church wasn't built on one person, one personality, one individual, I mean it. I mean it. The church started around a dining room table in my living room with a group of people who dreamed, dared to dream, that people would enter and feel as welcomed and as well-fed as they did walking into my home. Those dreams and those prayers birthed and pushed out the Father's house, OC. So when I say that this church wasn't built on one person or one personality, I mean it. This church was birthed on the backs of people who have said, oh, no, no, this isn't just for me. This is for my children and my children's children. I will use my time, my talent, my treasures to build a church that people can have a home in. So before we continue on and give God glory for the celebration, I want to give honor where honor is due. This has never been about one person. This has never been about one direction. This has never been about one bougie, rich financier who paid all of our bills. Oh, no. No, family. No. This is about building a home where people can walk in and find freedom and life in Jesus. For five years, that has been the cry of our heart that people would come in one way and encounter a good God, leave completely changed. When I talk about gritty, resilient people, I don't want you to think generally. I want you to think specifically. These people with their names behind me on the board have been with us since year one at M3. The list behind me are still with us today and they have either given, sown, or served here at TFH for the last five years. People like Michelle McKinley, Pastor Eric Tran, Dr. Cynthia D'Alba, Bob and Peggy Peterson, Justin Moreno, Victoria Peck, Cesar Delgado, Claudia Simons, Morgan Galvez, Joey Tosta, and every name that's on that screen. I salute you and I say your loyalty and your faithfulness has brought freedom and life to so many people. As a daughter of a Marine, uh, someone who celebrates those who served and give their life valiantly, within the military, you are awarded different medals. You get different medals of valor, medals of courage, medals of honor. Well, I decided, you know what? I'm in the Lord's Army. I know, cheesy. It's cheesy. Don't judge me. Whatever. But in the Lord's Army, I'm like, we need to acknowledge people who have built this church so beautifully. So I asked our creative director, Michelle, to create these keychains with the number five and our value for the year for every single person on this screen behind me. Because these are the people. Because these are the people that clean the bathrooms and answer emails and lead worship and lead community groups and they give to God what God has asked to give to them. And before you think you're like, no big deal, it's just a keychain, Bianca. Well, this keychain with the number five, for every single person who has been here for five years, guess what? You will get 10% off of every event for perpetuity, okay? Every event, every conference, every retreat, you get 10% off. Also, you get 10% off of all the cool merch, church merch that we have for perpetuity. You also get 15% off all of the bougie coffee drinks at our coffee bar. Can we thank those who have given and sown? Absolutely. Call me cheesy, I don't care. If you've known me since day one, I have said that this church is not built on a person or a personality. I said this church was never about one person. Or was it? In year five, I get to bring clarity to that statement. Hindsight's always 2020. And though I still mean that this church is not built on one person, I'm speaking about an earthly person or a personality. Five years in though, I wanna bring clarity. This church has, is, and will be built on one person, and that person is Jesus Christ Almighty. In year five, the year of God's grace, his divine power to overcome, I get to say that it is about Jesus, 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 Jesus. He is our chief cornerstone. He is our foundation. We put our trust in no man except this man. This community, this gathering, this building is about a man named Jesus. And anything 
that has occurred good in your life that you attribute, well, it's because I'm part of the Father's house. I want to let you know that it is built on no one else other than Jesus. Now, God might use someone on the worship team to help you experience freedom, but Jesus is the one that gave you freedom. God might use your community group leader to teach you something, but it is Jesus who transforms your heart. God might use me to disciple you through the truth of his words, but Jesus is the one that's renewing your mind. This is all about freedom and life in Jesus. Why do we have a DJ? Why do we have balloons? Why do we have a photo booth? Why do I want you to invite your friends? Because this is all about Jesus. And if you're here today, you're like, B, I don't feel like celebrating. You don't know my life. Do you know what Jesus says for you? Jesus this man, Jesus, he's speaking to you today out of Matthew 11, and he says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. This is my promise, Jesus is saying to us. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I know there's many people in this room who came today and you didn't want to celebrate. You're hurting and you're in pain. You want hope, but hope feels really far away. You want joy, but joy feels buried in a casket six feet under. You want to experience peace, but your life is nothing but chaos. You want to feel something, but all you feel is numb. The idea of celebrating feels like the last thing that you want to do. Can I be honest with you? I get you, I feel you, not pathetically, empathetically. I was meeting with my counselor this week. I was talking to her about the birthday. I was talking to her about what God has done. I was talking to her about you and what God has done in this community. And I told her that I'm so happy with everything that God has done and we get to celebrate but I'm also experiencing so much pain in my personal world. I'm experiencing such heaviness and sadness in a season of deep mourning. And she asked me, Bianca, why don't you like to talk about your pain publicly? Why are you so private? And I told her, I'm afraid of acknowledging my emotions because I don't wanna burden anyone else with the heaviness that is my reality the sadness that I'm carrying in my heart, that my soul feels fractured into a million pieces. She said, what if other people are feeling the exact same way as they walked into your church? What would you tell them? I was taken back by her question and I said, oh, I want them to know that God is not afraid of their emotions. I want them to know that God's not afraid of their questions, that God's not sad that they have pain or frustration, that this is a place where God sees them. He knows every hair on their head. He knows every tear that they shed. He knows every hope and every dream, every sin and every dread. He has seen them in the moments of darkness and he whispers over them in moments of life. And I would tell them, and I would promise them that they could have hope because Jesus is the hope of the world. And then she said, then tell them that. Tell them, Jesus has sustained the church not because you and Matt are flawless and perfect, but because Jesus is flawless and perfect. Tell them that God can handle everything that they have, the good, the bad, the happy, and the sad. So today, I'm going to admit to you that I have come to worship and praise Jesus and dance on broken bones because I'm in pain. But I know that God has given me grace, the ability to overcome. You might be in here, you might be experiencing sadness, pain, chaos. I'm here to tell you that you can celebrate in the midst of pain. I was talking to my counselor and I said, it feels like betrayal. If I feel happy, I feel like I'm pretending that I'm not sad. And if I feel sad, then I'm feeling like I have no happiness. She said, I want you to hold the tension of both. Because Jesus' grace is giving you the ability to come to him with your burdens, to come to him with your excitements, your fears, your questions. 
come to him. Lay them at his feet because his grace is for you. The ability to overcome. The grit that don't quit is the grace you can't waste. Don't waste this season. Don't waste the pain. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your money. Don't waste your tears. Let the tears that we fall water the seeds of hope in the ground. The grit that don't quit is the grace you can't waste. Don't waste the season. In the last four weeks, we've been in this series called Grit Don't Quit. And guess what? We're still here. We're still here. We're still here. That's why we're throwing a party. Because no matter what hurdles have come our way, we still keep going. When I tell that track story about falling over every hurdle, I usually stop right there. Because it sounds, if I'm honest with you, it sounds kind of a little humorous, but definitely heroic. Like, I kept going. I had the willpower to do it. But I never really tell the ending of that story. But I feel it's apropos today. I remember crying on the first aid station table and Julia was looking at me saying she was so proud of me. And I said, did you see the race? I came in dead last, the heat behind me passed me. She said, no, I'm so proud of you because you didn't quit. And immediately I stopped crying, confused and astounded and looked at her with tears streaming down my face and said, you mean I could have quit? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes when you don't know that quitting is an option, we could surprise ourselves by discovering that we were stronger than we ever thought because quitters never win and winners never quit, baby. Those who get back up know that their strength is not in them. It is in the grace of God. What is grace? The divine ability to overcome. And we give thanks and we give glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has not abandoned us, who has not forsaken us, who has not taken his love, uh, loving eye off of us, who has met every need, that every bill has been paid, that we have been in the black every single month since our existence, that we've survived a global pandemic, that we've had people abandoned, we've had people jump ship, and God is still faithful. Though man may fail us, God will never fail us. That is why Paul the Apostle in Ephesians 3.20, he puts it this way. Now to him, now to Jesus, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask, think, hope, or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us through the work of his Holy Spirit. To him be the glory in the church at the Father's house, Orange County, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever and ever. Amen. Jesus is the Son of God, the God who spoke and time began, the God who breathed in Adam again and again, the God who parted the land from the sea, the God who called day out of night, the God who causes mountains to quake and lands to shake, the God who lifts the sun and dips the moon, the God who sent his son Jesus to hang in shame and rose from the grave for our gain, the Jesus whose death has brought us life, the Jesus who sees our head hang low and it lifts our gaze high. The Jesus who knows our past and grants us a future. The Jesus who is over all and under nothing. The Jesus who chases the one and leaves the nine to nine. The Jesus who promises you a future and a hope. The Jesus who will never leave you, abandon you, or forsake you. The Jesus who knows you. The Jesus who forgives you. That's a testimony right there. The Jesus who sees you. The Jesus who feels your pain and knows your shame. It is that Jesus who is calling you by your very name. Jesus is strong. Jesus is loving. Jesus is kind. Jesus is forgiving. And on this fifth year of life, I've come to say that we have been sustained by the grace of a good God who sent his son Jesus. Because the grit that don't quit is the grace we can't waste. If you're here today, we are celebrating. Yes, we're celebrating that God has sustained us as a church. But guess what, family? I'm celebrating that God has sustained you. He has given you another day with breath in your lungs and a beat in your chest and a think in your mind and a blink in your eyes. And that God sent his son Jesus because he loves you and wants to be in relationship with you. If you are here today, you were invited by a friend. You've never known about this good man by the name of Jesus who lived a sinless life and died a horrific death out of love for you. 
He died on a cross called Calvary out of love, but because it wasn't just love, he also exemplified extreme power. He didn't just die and hang on a cross. He resurrected three days later from the grave to prove his power and authority over death. That's why Paul says, oh death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? If you are here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe at one point you have, but you've walked away from the Lord and you know you wanna come back, today's the day of salvation. If you're here today, I'm going to count to three and invite you to raise your hand if you are saying yes to Jesus, to be the Lord and Savior of your life. But I want to put some understanding around this. We're raising our hands. One, we are declaring that we believe Jesus is the Lord and Savior of our life. Two, by raising our hands and publicly declaring, we are saying that my mistakes and my failures, what the Bible refers to as sin, can be forgiven through the power of Jesus and his shed blood on the cross. And finally, three, Believing that the same power that Paul speaks about in Romans 10 that resurrected Jesus from the grave that will live in us the power of his spirit. I usually invite everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads, but today's a celebration. We want to celebrate with people who are getting in a right alignment for their assignment in a relationship with Jesus. If that is you, loud and proud, you want Jesus. One, two, three. Will you raise your hand if you were saying yes to Jesus for the first time or coming back? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else online in the video experience or someone that could see your hand? God bless you. Anyone else? Bye. Nice and high. Yes. Tell buddy testify. I love this. God bless you. Yes. Why are we celebrating? We're celebrating because people are entering into a right relationship with Jesus to let them know that they're not alone. Let's pray this prayer of faith with them. Will you repeat after me and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, cleanse my conscience. Fill me with your spirit to do what I cannot do. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' good, glorious, and gracious name. Can we stand and honor God? Because He is a God who is good. He is a God who is good. He is a God who has lavished us with grace. So let us worship God in spirit and truth.